Welcome to Moonbeaming, a podcast about lunar living, magic, creativity, tarot, and more. I'm your host, Sarah Faith Godestiner, and I'm so honored and excited to be here with you today. This episode is brought to you by Elements of Sage, providing ethically sourced sage bundles, handcrafted with mountain sagebrush, aromatic herbs, flowers, and crystals. These sage bundles create an extraordinary burning experience. You will love the holistic and energetic healing benefits when burning their sage bundles. You can learn more about the benefits of burning the sage because each bundle comes with an info card listing the healing benefits and sage burning directions. Elements of Sage sustainably harvests sage on a private farm in the northern Utah mountains. The sage species is the Big Mountain Sagebrush. Those who are looking for a white sage alternative will fall in love with this species. Elements of Sage is a woman-owned company. Go check out their beautiful products. Use the code MOONBEAMING to receive 15% off. Again, that's MOONBEAMING, all one word, all caps, to receive 15% off. And we'll put that link in the show notes. Happy full moon. How are you? No, really. How are you? Probably more than a one word answer, probably more than a one word response. A friend of mine, we're just joking that we really all collectively have to change how are you as a first point of contact during these times and beyond because it's not a reasonable ask, especially if we want to be honest about how we are and especially if we really want to know how the other person is, it's going to take a lot of time. So We've been playing around with, how great to see you, or I'm so happy and grateful to be here with you, or hey, hi, anything you'd like to share? I'd love to hear. So, you know, as you all know, I always have so much to share. This week is no different. This week's episode is about timeline jumping. It's about time. It's about changing our relationship to time. It's about possibilities. It's about taking leaps. So I wanted to begin by covering different concepts of time, how to talk and think about time differently. I'm going to talk a bit about my own process cover what a timeline jump is, share some signs, you might be ready for one, and hopefully it'll inspire you. I always want to begin by reiterating that our ontologies, that is how we make meaning, is complex And it has to do with a lot of different factors, our backgrounds, what epoch we are in, what our philosophies are, who our teachers are, who our lineages are, what kind of culture or society we exist in, and so on and so forth. I've spoken a lot about looking at things and interpreting things contextually and historically. I've talked about this a lot with astrology. I've talked about this a lot with magic, with folklore, different customs. 
I just talked about the Six of Cups and the evil eye and how that intersects with ancestral traumas slash folklores slash traditions from my personal heritage, possibly yours. You know, we learn as part of our discernment process that everything is contextual, nothing operates in a vacuum, and ancient traditions and philosophies, they're not always suitable for this time. Sometimes they absolutely are, but in my opinion, we cannot simply back up an interpretation, a tradition, an idea solely by invoking well, the ancients said it. It's similar to me saying, well, we should definitely adhere 100% to the Constitution. I just don't believe that we should. I believe it's a historical document and it needs to change and it needs to update. And the people who wrote the Constitution thought a lot of things that were not okay. And often those who write the laws have the power they're sharing their ontology, they're sharing their worldview historically. It was a specific kind of person who had access to sharing information through books. And those people were writing for a specific audience and in a specific time. And we have to recognize this. But you already know this, gentle listener. The wonderful Liz from Sister Spinster who was on this podcast, she said somewhere, I cannot remember if it was on the podcast episode she was on or in another context. Once she shared to read between the lines in old herbalism books. If in this book from 100 years ago or older, if in the book it says, well, a plant is evil specifically if there's some connection to the feminine, that often meant it was actually powerful and magical, and they maybe didn't want certain people using it. So I think it's always a really important part of our own processes, whether they be thinking, magical, practical, repatterning stuff, to really think about our personal context, to think about how we've been informed and who has informed us, and to play with ideas and concepts and to experiment with imagination and curiosity and wonder to our concepts about what we are focusing on. And in this case, it's time. And in doing so, we can prepare ourselves if we feel called for a timeline jump. I've also been thinking a lot about this in terms of Saturn. I've been thinking a lot about Saturn this year because of the devil. Uh, it's We're in a devil teacher card year. Uh, again, I've talked about this a lot on other episodes of the podcast, so you can check those all out. Right now, Saturn is retrograde until October, and next year, Saturn moves into Pisces. Retrogrades are often a great time to reflect, and Saturn is often thought about being about linear time, material time, father time, cause and effect structures, bones, about our boundaries, about our limits, about endings. Saturn is the farthest planet away from us in the universe that we can see. In classical astrology, there are seven cosmic bodies because those were what humans could see with the naked eye. There are more planets. There's Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, although I won't get into all that. But Saturn, time, endings, restructuring, structures, recalibrations, material world, concepts. 
Where did you learn about time? I'm like thinking about right now in my mind what came in were all of those all those um, Salvador Dali paintings of the clocks just wobbling. That feels like a kind of interesting image to play with. What did you learn about time? How did you learn about how time worked? How was time organized when you were growing up through your early adulthood? When were instances in your life when your relationship with time changed? Or how is it changing now? I've shared with the folks in my Embodying Abundance class and probably elsewhere, one of my scarcities that I'm always trying to heal and I'm always trying to recalibrate is with time. And some of that has to do directly with my ADHD. There's this really not great term that I think is ableist and just not okay. It's called time blindness. I think it has to change. I think we could simply call it time management challenges or time interpretation challenges. I don't know. But that mm, challenge, I'll just say for now, that's also what makes us really talented witches. Because often for folks with ADHD, we have this relationship to time that I call no time or now time, where everything is happening all at once, everything is important all at once. And when it's not cool, it feels like we have to begin everything at once. And then we get overwhelmed and we shut down. Sound familiar? You can raise your hand. And also, when we're really collaborating with this, we have this special ability to be in now time when we're resourced, when we're in the present moment, when we're engaged. And that is so similar to being in flow, being in circle, when we're in ritual or spell work. If we can collaborate with it effectively, if we can harness it, it really is a beautiful thing and a wonderful skill set to have, which is know that that's what we do when we cast a circle. We create a container, a portal. It's outside of time, but it's also all time. It's infinite time. We are tearing holes or creating holes in time. We are shortening timelines. We're bringing in support and changing our fate. No big deal, right? So I'll pin this idea of no time equals now time equals all time. I'll pin it for now. I'll loop back around to this probably a couple of different times. <laughs> Drinking game. Every time I say time, drink your time tincture. T-H-Y-M-E. Okay. So like I said, my one of my biggest scarcities is time. And I have to think about healing that. I can kind of go to thinking about how, you know, time has gotten stolen from me. I think that's a really big point of grief or tenderness or anger even with those of us who have experienced trauma because trauma steals your time. I have stuff around being chronically ill and not always being able to feel like I'm in control of my time because how my body is and how my illness is, is very, for lack of a better word, you know, it's, it's unpredictable. So some days I might have four hours to do what I like to do. Other days I might have eight, you know, I'm, I'm always kind of compromising with what I would like to do and what my body would like to do. So there's that. And then I think like there's that very real mm, discomfort with time as someone who has basically worked since I was 12. And I'm sure those of you listening who, you know, have had to work from a really young age and 
have always had to have like two jobs or they're in school and they have two jobs or, you know, all, like always having to go to a different job and your whole entire life revolves around that, which I think is very common, right? Like I think this is a very common thing in the United States. I have stuff around that. So when we're talking about healing, whatever it is we're healing, we do have to look at some of the foundations. We do have to look at what caused some of the not awesome relationship or viewpoint of the time, you know? And then of course, on top of that, there's my own stuff with all the time I feel like sometimes I waste and that's intense, right? So I'm using this uh, because I've been doing time magic uh, and I know some people have wanted me to talk about time magic. Some folks in some of my classes have requested it. Uh, we're not totally getting into time magic all the way, but it will touch on this process. So of course, after examining some of those foundations, those ontologies, my personal ontologies, then thinking about whatever larger societal ontologies have snuck their way into my subconscious around productivity or time being money or, you know, all of these other things that can be a challenge. After that, we next move into transforming our relationship because obviously the basis of witchcraft is about relationship. We are in relationship with that which we are healing, conjuring, summoning, wanting to amplify, so on and so forth. The question I will often ask folks who take my classes or some of my clients, if they are having a challenge, I ask, what is your relationship to the thing you would like to change or you have some sort of um, issue with? Often we feel controlled by the thing or we feel like we're not great at the thing. The thing invokes anxiety, is attached to other th other pain points. It's a symbol of something that's like a greater wound. And so then often we'll avoid it or we'll shut down and we don't feel like we have the right or we don't feel like we have the capacity to be intimate or collaborators, like friendly collaborators with the thing. We might feel like we don't even have a relationship at all with the thing or that it's like complex and we can't talk about it. It's complicated. You know, it's like, welcome to life, angel. Welcome to life. Here we are, right? Dearly beloved, let's let's get through this together. So once we do some parsing, then it gets exciting. Because when you are resourced, when you are ready to imagine, you can ask yourself, what do I want this relationship to be? How do I want this relationship to feel? How do I want to embody certain aspects of how I inhabit myself when dealing with this concept, dealing with this portion of my life? Personally, what I realized is that in order to recalibrate my relationship with time, I wanted to feel like my time is like an investment and that I am present and in presence. When I'm not, when I spend time, I don't get it back. It can sometimes feel, mm, I'll use this word, it can sometimes feel like I'm wasting my own time. So I know it's intense. The first thing I needed to do was realize that no time is a waste. That's like very, um, it's very scarcity programming. Um, I also wanted to dream, I also needed to dream about what I wanted my relationship with time to be like. I really want to feel like time is my friend. So I needed to act like time was my friend. I needed to root out 
some of those subconscious thoughts, like there's not enough time or I can't manage my time and so on. And the next part, of course, that I always talk about is clarity. How do you want things to feel and what kinds of activities and things resonate with that? I wanted to feel like I could rest without guilt or rest first after, you know, doing the chore or the work or getting back to someone. I wanted to feel like in general, not always like this is life. Hello, we all have things we have to do that we might not want to do. Again, this is called life. Um, but as as much as I could, I wanted to feel like a lot of what I was doing, at least in my, in quote, free time, another real issue that I'm unpacking, like another like mm, challenging word, I think. But, you know, the part of my life where I'm, where my time is my own, let's just say that. And also my entire life, really, I wanted to feel like my time had meaning. It had um, some sort of purpose. It was restorative. It was generative. And the next step of what I had to do was take a time inventory. And I had to be honest because folks will think about how their current relationship is with the thing. They'll think about where they want to go. And then all this mm, distance is created, right? They're like, oh my gosh, I want to be here, but I'm here. Linear time thinking. And then all the doubt and the fear and the distance and the lack of intimacy, the linear timeness of it all comes in, the lack comes in, right? And then we'll shut down. I've done this in my own life before. It's very normal. It's very common. And I've also done this kind of work long enough to know that this could be a challenge and to be gentle with myself. And I trust myself to make changes. I've changed many, many times. I've been many, many different people. So I was able to do that, right? I was able to look at like what drained me, what felt precious and sacred and good to me now, what lit me up, what inspired me, and what maybe were the habits and the behaviors that did it. And then taking into account the sphere of influence, we are clear about what we can control and what we can change. We know what we can't. And we know that once we start collaborating with expansion, we have to be open to possibilities we couldn't necessarily like do on our own or see on our own. Our life becomes more like clay. So there's this whole process of recalibration and taking responsibility and understanding where I have to change and being in process with making those changes, right? Um, and in last weeks, in the last mini sode, I talked about all of that, like when sometimes we're not so nice to ourselves. So you can listen to that. I'm sharing about all of this because I'm in it. So it's very real. It's very resonant. One of the last things I needed to do, there's more, but I'm just taking you through the basics, was to prep myself for a big shift to come, to prepare myself. And I think this is really useful for uh, folks who have experienced trauma, like I think it's trauma-informed, trauma-informed timeline jumping, to understand a change is coming, to resource ourselves, to have more fun and play and pleasure with the idea of whatever it is we, we are trying to change. So like having fun with this idea of time, like time could be something different. The idea of linear time is this capitalist imprint. It's that Monday through Friday, 40 hour work week, completely made up, right? This is an ontology. In fact, our work week was much longer, much greater. There were no permissions around it. And I don't want to get into the ins and outs of our culture because a 40 hour work week for many people is not a reality. It's much greater than that, right? But I'm just utilizing this as our framework. 
this understanding in this country. But there are other ideas wrapped in with linear time, like, um, I don't know, uh, a book deal takes this long to get. Making a, an album takes this long. Um, there's also acknowledging our maybes. Maybe one day I'll figure out how to take three weeks off work. Maybe one day I'll start a morning routine, whatever, whatever it is. I'm just, you know, brainstorming here. That thought process often creates distance and distance creates a lack of intimacy. So this thing is the other that creates fear that often leads to avoidance, which also then in turn builds resistance. Maybe go back, rewind that again. <laughs> but remember, we can play with the ideas, we can explore, we can use our imaginations, and we can bring in again this idea of now time, present time, flow time, as being no time, as being all time. Here we are back there again. I wanted to introduce three different ideas and concepts about time that can prep us for timeline jumping. The first one is from one of my backgrounds, which is Judaism. There is one concept in Kabbalistic philosophy that introduces the idea of time as time being a spiral. It spirals around a point or direction that moves towards a future, which is a future of transformation, evolution, healing. And sometimes when we look at this spiral from the side, think like imagine in your mind a spring, you know, like a like a spring coiled getting tighter and tighter and also like moving up towards a point. When we see it from the side, the spiral appears to be going backwards or we appear to be going backwards. We appear to not be making any progress when really we're being given the opportunity to revisit, to see a similar theme or pattern from a different perspective. And in doing so, we can respond differently and thus move forward. Now, if we don't, which we all have those moments where we don't, you know, I, again, raise his hand, took me a while to learn many lessons, many of them, still learning many of them. So if we don't, if we stay in that same pattern, we stay in that same reaction, we stay in that same spiral, we stay in the past, it can feel like we're trapped or we're looping because often we are, right? Like part of healing is understanding what activates us, understanding what our wounds are and res resourcing ourselves so that we might reparent ourselves and deal with situations and repattern our energetics, repattern our emotions, open our capacity and in doing so, create opportunities. That's like one definition. There are many, of course. And BT dubs, the first person I heard talking about this concept of spiral time, not like the mm, granulars of it that I just shared, but the first person was Starhawk. I learned about that. I literally think, I'm trying to look for the book. You can Google it. I think it's The Spiral Path. I could be wrong. Anyway, the first place I read that spiral idea was with Starhawk. And then later I learned about this concept in Jewish mysticism. And I love that. You know, you'll you'll hear people talk about healing being a spiral. This is true. 
I am sure that a great many other lineages across the planet, maybe even the solar system, have this concept in their philosophy, in their ontology, because so much of our experience of life is circular. It's cyclical. This is what the moon teaches us. We always have this chance to begin again, to revisit things, but differently. We always have a chance to heal by going deeper, by greeting and being with the same kinds of themes in different ways. Literally, this is one of the bases of my teachings, of my moon map teaching. All you moon mappers get it. So that's one way to play around with time, to think that we can hop we can hop up and down the spiral. We can understand that even though something feels the same, it's different and we can proceed accordingly, thus shifting reality. We can play around with it. Okay. Another way to play around with time, right? Like I'm not saying one is better. I think they're all fun to play around with. We know that multiple things can be true. Another way to think about time is like a mushroom network, a root system, like mycelium, like a web, right? Because we can think about the Big Bang and we can think about how our universe is expanding always, you know? We can think of time as a cosmic, intelligent root system or web, like all flowing in different ways with different data points. There's this multiverse idea. There are these infinite ways, like I'm almost thinking in my mind like a web, and then there's these little like nodes that connect these different pathways, right? Like neuro pathways. So there are different ways that we can move around within these webs. We could stay the way we're going. We could attempt to join onto another pathway, another path of possibilities. And this weaves in the idea that time flows both ways. We are not only in flow towards the future. The future is also in a flow towards us. Ideal futures spring forth when we're leaning into the qualities of future time that can exist. A timeline jump is signaling to the universe and all aspects of ourself, our subconscious, our, our conscious, our, you know, greater conscious, future crone, whatever you want to call it, future self. It's signaling how and where it can meet us and where we want to go. We're charting a different course. We're consciously choosing a different thread. Another way we can think about time is like it's a book. All pages exist at once. It's all there. We're on one page. Maybe we want to go to another page that's already there, that already exists. It's a multiverse. There are many different universes happening at the same time simultaneously. There's a different you, three pages down, maybe you want to get into. There's that awesome movie I highly recommend you check out called Everything Everywhere All at Once that explores this. Uh, for those who want a slightly less mm, mm, wonderful movie, I'm trying to be kind. There's Sliding Doors. Uh, if any of you have seen that, it's kind of like this idea of playing with the multiverse, different possibilities. So a timeline jump is a conscious choice to move into that different reality, to change your reality, to change the different version of you. In fact, by changing you, how you embody, what you embody, how your energy runs, what you're turning towards, you change your reality and you begin to explore and experience another version of your reality. You can think of timeline jumping in this way of one of those picture books, 
those flip books where there's like an image of like a cat jumping over an apple or something, right? Like the flip books, every page is a page of that demarcates time. And a timeline jump could be that you're like jumping to the last page. So all time existing simultaneously. I think we can also understand this with thinking about how we react or how we act in the present time. You know, sometimes we can pop over and be in our inner child. Maybe our inner child is having us experience the present moment, like not in the best way. We're living in the past, but we're in the present moment. We're responding to something in the present moment, but our response, our reaction is based on something that happened in the past. It was a different timeline, right? It's our reality. It's a timeline, but it's not the present moment. And that's why it's really important when we want to timeline jump or accelerated heal or move forward or experience reality in a fundamentally different way. We've got to come into the present moment energetically. We have to experience now time, right? Like the past is past. The future hasn't happened yet. The present is a gift. And a timeline jump helps us create a reality that is independent of the past. We've gone beyond linear time outside of cause and effect. We're creating a future based on our imagination, certain visions. We're creating something based off our heart, not in response or reaction to. Similar to the process of neuroplasticity, we're firing different connections. We're shortening the distance. It's a way to move forward quickly and with acceleration. It's a way to shorten linear timelines to hop into another chapter with more ease, with more pleasure, with more fun. And I do want to like underscore that this isn't escapism. We're jumping into different paradigms because we've made peace with the past. We don't want to relive the past. We've, we have acceptance with it. We've made closure, and now we want to experience something different. I wanted to share a couple of ways to tell if you are ready to experience a timeline jump. And honestly, if this just sounds intriguing, you know, like play, have fun, right? Life might feel like Groundhog Day. It might feel a bit stale. You're kind of doing the same thing every day. That's a pretty clear demarcation. Some people love routine and they love structure and I love it, right? I'm. That's not what I mean. I mean like you feel like I don't want to be doing this again and again, right? And this is also, I want to really clarify, I am not a mental health practitioner. I'm not talking about depression, by the way. This is a different feeling. And if you feel like you're depressed, please try to get help, right? I don't discuss mental health. I'm not a licensed mental health facilitator or practitioner. I just want to be clear. But you just sort of feel like mm, meh, <laughs> meh about life overall, you know? That's one way. And then another is this feeling of looking around your current life and you almost feel like it's the life of a stranger. Again, I'm not talking about like clinical, um, what's the word? Oh, geez. What is it? Disassociation. I'm not talking about that. It's more of like a subtle disconnection. Uh, like you look around and you don't recognize yourself. You look at your things, the books you own, what your bed looks like or whatever. And you're like, this doesn't, this doesn't feel like me anymore. And simultaneously, 
you are changing. Like that's, that's what that means, right? And so a timeline jump can really help accelerate and propel that change. It's a pretty specific sort of feeling. And it also denotes you've outgrown your life. And this happens. It's a normal part of life. The dreams you had five years ago, I don't know that they're supposed to be the same dreams. Sometimes they are, right? Sometimes dreams take a while, but it's pretty normal for us every few years to want change because we've changed. Another way to tell is if you just feel complete in a large area of your life, like you've come, you've, you've done what you came here to do in a certain specific area, you've maybe finished a big project, you know, created something you feel proud of, you feel a sense of acceptance or closure in some sense. It could feel really good. Like, yeah, I feel I feel like I did this. It could also obviously not feel great. Like, I did this, I'm tired, it's a breakup. I tried, I tried, and now I'm at this proverbial end of the road. Another way to tell is if certain things keep repeating, like on loop. You keep dating different people, but the same thing keeps happening. You keep getting just to the end of a job interview process, right? Like going in for like four interviews, but you keep not getting it. Or you keep finding yourself like talking about the same things, but maybe not getting anywhere with it and so on. So you're glitching in some way and it's time to dissolve out of that glitch if you so choose. The last way to tell if you're ready to timeline jump is you just want to. You're ready for something totally different. You know what that is enough to have that clarity and go through a process. You are resourced for that. Like I talked in one of my episodes, I think it was like spells for uncertain times. You can go back and listen to. We don't always want to create a change, right? We don't, I mean, we're changed. Like you, you can do nothing or you could just live your life, not read one self-help book, not go to therapy. You will change. Life is change, right? The universe is change. We are always changing, even if we don't feel it, right? And sometimes we don't need more change. We're already dealing with enough. We don't need one more thing. But you might be ready if you're like, you know what? I'm, I, I want to do this. I think this could be really fun. I have this willingness to change. I want to explore. I want my life to feel like wet clay. I want to make different shapes with my life. That sounds really fun right now. I'm available to that, right? Because again, we don't always want to initiate change. We don't always want to be doing self-optimization and more, more, more. I think that can sometimes, mm, I think there can sometimes be a romanticization of fresh starts in the new and all of this stuff when I personally have experienced a lot of growth from having the same long-term relationships with beloveds, having long-term relationships with projects. So again, I just want to be clear if you're like, yeah, no, I'm good. I, that's great. I love that for you. If you feel ready for a change, timeline jumping is an awesome way to begin new chapters, embody and explore different aspects of yourself and bring forth potential realities quickly. It's a way to experience reality differently. There are a lot of ways we can timeline jump. I go over a cheat sheet in the guide in many moons. I had more to say about it. So I created a mini workshop about it where I discuss a process this is a great place to start this episode as a primer to get you thinking about time. 
what it means. And then I also have a set of meditations, a short teaching around the process that gets a bit more granular, along with a step-by-step series, series of worksheets and suggested directions that goes into detail about how you can play an experiment with a timeline jump of your own. If you feel ready, if it feels exciting to you, I suggest you check it out. It's on my site. The link is in the show notes. I'm excited about it. It'll be available for a while until the equinox. That's when it feels good. So check it out. Tell me what you think. I think you'll like it. That's our episode for this week. It's a wonderful opportunity to continue on with August themes of leaps, risk-taking. The studio has an abundance of offerings for you this month that support it. Of course, there's many moons. There's the guide. We have an energetic up-level session later this month. We have the aforementioned timeline mini workshop resource. And then at the end of the month, we begin an exciting journey in resourcing the creative self. All of the links are in the show notes. I hope to see you at one or a couple of these spaces. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you have a beautiful full moon. Drink all the water. Try out all the compassion. Practice all the dreaming. Play with your imagination. And I'll be back soon. Moon Beaming is brought to you by the Moon Studio. It is created and hosted by me, Sarah Faith Godestiner. It is edited by Rose Blakelock with a lot of additional help from Hazel Frew. It is supported by our beautiful patrons, which you can join over at patreon.com, The Moon Studio. If you would like to further support the podcast, you can sign up for a sponsorship. You can rate and review it or share it with your friends or on your social media. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you so much.